again for the CX uh, podcast number four. And I'm so happy to introduce you to Alton Martin, a good friend of mine and a pioneer in the customer experience uh, industry. Alton, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, Russ. Thanks for asking. That's good. I am so glad to have you join me. I was hoping you would have been my first victim, uh, but we just couldn't get it to work out because of uh, some some stuff going on. But I'm glad everything worked out. And I almost caught you on your birthday. So happy birthday That's a couple right. days ago. That's right. <laughs> so, so a little bit um, about this podcast. What I want to do is create the number one podcast in the world for customer experience because not too many people do this. And I think having out in Martin is going to help propel this to be the best podcast out there. So with that said, I'd like Alton, I'd like you to tell us a little bit about who you are, just a quick um, elevator talk about who you are really quick, and then we can get started. Okay, Alton Martin, and I've been in the uh, customer care and uh, contact center BPO space for about 30 years. I uh, got started here in uh, Austin, Texas in 1992 when I uh, was running a call center and distribution fulfillment operation for a company that printed software manuals. And I'll date myself now. Back, back then, the number one selling software in the U.S. was WordPerfect. It retailed for almost $500. You got 27 diskettes and a stack of books when you bought it. And that was pretty wow. typical of the industry. Hey, uh, I still remember doing WYSIWYG on Lotus 1, 2, 3. So, oh, so I've got you beat. <laughs> And so uh, actually Novell was our, our primary client and we were publishing, um, uh, I'm trying to think, what was it? What was Novell's signature release? I think 3.1 of Netware. And uh, if yeah. you were a Novell certified network engineer, that was, that was the bomb. That was the best certification you could get as an individual. And uh, literally the, the packages were too heavy to ship to a central distribution facility. So they asked us to print them kit and assemble them and keep them. And then they would call us or have individuals call us to, to uh, fulfill the order. And that's what put us in the call center space. Wow. And I discovered there um, a lot of the buyers really didn't know what they were doing. And that led to the creation of COPC when I called up one of my, my buddies who'd been a Baldrige judge and said, you wouldn't believe the people who were coming here from Microsoft and Dell and Compact and and places like that and they they're asking all the wrong questions they just they don't even know what they're doing and so we decided to set up a consultancy to help and that that's what led to COPC I was the CEO there for about let's see from 94 95 till 2009 I set up our operations um, outside the US so in the UK Argentina uh, Singapore, Australia, India, Japan, uh, and China. Uh, so I spent 75% of my time in that during those years outside the U.S. Uh, then in 2009, I uh, decided to stop the international stuff and started my own consultancy and concentrated on, on companies in Texas and um, didn't and I did both sides. I represented the BPOs on the buy side, and I represented uh, internal call centers on operational process improvement. And then in 2013, uh, along with a, a couple other colleagues, we decided to open up our own contact center, and we focused on the Internet of Things space. And our enabling client was Nest. Um, we thought we would have a hundred people, maybe in a really lucky event after a year, we had 220 within 90 days. Um, in 2015 or no, 2016, we were named the fastest growing company in central Texas. Uh, we had then opened up a facility in, uh, Limerick, Ireland. And then in December, 2018, uh, we sold the company to a Singaporean based BPO called Everize. Um, and, um, then I just went off and said, I'm going to do some independent consulting, which is what I'm doing now. Fantastic. <laughs> so I've been in the space a long time. Well, I remember you from my days at Dell when we were using, uh, the COPC standard to determine who our, our outsourcing partners would be. So I've known you for a long time. Quick fact, fun fact, Novell 
or at least the label Novell is still out there. Novell has this KB that is uh, nested within Genesis platform uh, as a embedded KB. Wow. Yeah. I don't know it's if it's the original Novell, that, but, but yeah. it's it's definitely Novell with the trademark. Yeah, yeah. so I, I, I saw that on a recent RFP. I was going through it. And I'm like, is that Novell? Really? <laughs> but they got a KB now. <laughs> and it's inside Genesis. Yep. Well, great. So I think that's a, a great introduction, a lot better than I could have done. I knew all that, but I probably would have forgot most of it. So you've seen it all. You saw the Malcolm Baldridge Quality Award process, which was the granddaddy in the 80s and the 90s. I remember that one. So we all were. competed for the Malcolm. That was the big thing. And then you were the heart and soul of COPC and one of the founders of COPC, which I think was the gold standard in the 90s, 2000s, even up until – uh, uh, until now. So what do you think is uh, the next great thing in terms of um, quality governance? I mean, you've got ISO type stuff. You've got all kinds of stuff out there. Six Sigma, Agile. What do you think is the next thing? Or is it COPC? I think it's going to be uh, a standard or a set of metrics around process management. Um, the, the challenge with, with a broad-based approach like Baldridge or ISO or COPC is the, the core elements are pretty solid, but when you get into the specifics around what's the difference between supporting a really complex product like an Internet of Things uh, hub uh, versus something that's somewhat simple, like can I can you replace my contact lenses? Yeah. It, it get it gets really difficult to say. Well, there's one approach that works. So I think I think in, just like uh, at an individual level, a, a PMP license or or certification is pretty valuable. I think there'll be recognition in the in the CX space that this individual or this team is really knowledgeable about how to design and implement complex processes and sustain them. It's, it's one thing to set them up. It's another thing to sustain them. And let, let me give you an example. When we were supporting Internet of Things devices, we created a methodology. It's, it's fun, at its root, it's just root cause analysis. It's the five whys. And we branded it um, uh, PQI, Product Quality Initiative. And what we were doing was trying to get information back to engineering teams so they could engineer out of subsequent releases of the product the defects that were causing transaction volume to hit the center. That's pretty complex. I mean, that's not something that somebody just comes in and, and picks up in, in a week of training. I mean, you, you've got yeah. you've to you've know your stuff. You've got to You've got to know some Six Sigma methodologies. You've got to know training methodologies. You've got to learn how to analyze lots of call volume, whether you just do it yourself by listening or whether you use AI tools. And I think that kind of certification or is going to be valuable. And the, the example I always use is, look, PMP, if you if pre-PMP, you're worth X. You could show up with the PMP and all of a sudden you're worth 20% more. And, yeah. so, and so when these kind of certifications get out there and they hit the CX space, um, the, the challenge with certifying sites or organizations is they're just too complex. There's too many, yeah. there's too many wheels in, uh, in motion. Uh, and, and that's not the purpose of certification uh, in and of itself. I think kind of went away. That's what happened to Baldridge. It just, it just was trying to cover too much of a, of a broad spectrum. Right. Whereas an individual certification, I think, has a lot of value, both to the individual and to the organization. Well, I know a lot of recent PMP sort of certified individuals and some that are on that track right now. So they're going to be happy to hear what you just said. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. It's a discipline that that really um, lends uh, credence. I mean, you probably remember John Tower, our, our initial um, out-of-box guy at Dell who ran our studies, um, top-box analysis, lost Six Sigma yeah. stuff for initial failures of a desktop or a server, what caused it, so that in the uh, in our first war room, uh, first 30 days, we could see 
what's breaking and, and do a, a quick root cause analysis so we could fix it before before too much got shipped out. So that Absolutely. kind of thing is really over. It sounds like you perfected that while um, you worked in that Internet of Things type stuff. So, uh, right. but yeah, that's that's good stuff and uh, that's gold right there. So so you're saying it's more of a um, lasered in focus of the 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 practitioners and not the site. I Correct. Think is what I mean. Okay, Correct. that makes sense. Okay, um, so you kind of answered a couple of my other questions. Um, we I was going to ask you if you thought uh, certification of, of sites was still important. It doesn't sound like it from what you're saying. And to be honest with you, I don't think it's important either. But um, uh, yeah, and I just don't see it very often. Uh, yeah. I hardly ever see it in the U.S. And uh, and it seems to be more important in certain regions like in, in Argentina. It's still a kind of a yeah. thing. Well, you have at least a little bit. I mean, yeah. people don't want to get fired for bringing on a a third party vendor or a provider. So they want to have something to say, well, these guys are certified by X, Y, Z so that yeah. I don't get fired, you know? So, yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a defensive but, posture. It yeah. is. It totally is. Well, I mean, you've already covered a lot of the things that I wanted to talk to you about, but but in terms of CX, I mean, you've got um, processes, you've got technology, you have technology enablers, you've got AI, you've got machine learning. What do you see like three or four years from now, if you have a crystal ball of, of CX trends, things that can uh, impact the customer experience? And I'm talking about the wide spectrum, not just you know, the high tech stuff, just uh, customer experience. What do you see that can govern the improvement for the masses, if you will? Um, I, it, that, that's a really good question. And I have maybe this could be a controversial uh, approach to it. I think most companies talk a good story about CX, but when you really cut to the chase, it's like, are, is this a board level metric? Is this a is this a C-suite level metric? No, and no, it turns it turns out to be a metric that dies up about midway up the up the executive chain. So it's really common to go into organizations and they and let's say you're a retail clerk. We're going to rate the retail clerk on the, you know the customer satisfaction with you. We're not going to rate us on our ability to have the right product in the stores. <laughs> You know, we're 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 gonna. I have a, 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 a guy I've known for 20 years. Who work? He now works at Spectrum. He's one of these guys who, you know, I just want to be a really good tier one agent. I don't want to be a supervisor. I don't want to be a QA analyst. I don't want to be a manager. I want to come in, do my job, do it really well, and leave. And um, and you know, at Spectrum, they, they, there's this immense pressure on the frontline agents to get good CX scores which are determined through an automated tool that so no, no, no other human being ever listens to the call, but the agent gets rated, but the site doesn't get rated, you know, and, and, and yeah. at the same organization, a guy I've known for, I don't know, many years, he just got appointed the EVP of a group that includes customer sat. And I sent him a message on LinkedIn and said, buddy, you got a long call this is a steep hill and don't show up in the town I live and say you say you work at that company because there's going to be a target on your back. And I think the well, problem that's the key industry in general, the, the traditional. I mean, there were movies about how bad services with the cable industry. So. Oh, yeah. And it's still bad. And uh, and so I think that the, the, the CX challenge is can we actually move this up the executive chain and make it a real metric? Just like return on investment or return on right. equity or cash flow, um, you know those those are you, you get you get hired and fired when you miss that. Um, but I, I was reading something this past week, and I think it was something like customer satisfaction with the top fifty manufacturers, and the top one was seventy six percent customer satisfaction. And I'm thinking, oh my lord, that's two hundred and forty thousand defects per million. So if you're making five million automobiles, you just you just produced a million people who don't like your product. And, and so I would love to see this, the, the CX trend be companies at the top level are really starting to pay attention to this. 
I think small companies do, and I think small to medium companies, because they live or die by, by customer retention sure. and, and word of mouth. But the big guys, I'm not so sure. There's a, a, a a you got Apple, which coincidentally has always had really high NPS, and yep. they have high retention and uh, intense loyalty, customer loyalty. Uh, yeah. So I don't know which which comes first, the chicken or the egg with them, but, but they certainly... Uh, at their C-suite, look at, at loyalty and retention of their customers. Yeah, and they're, and they're one of the exceptions Samsung, for these companies. I, I am in violent agreement. I think that they, they, you know, they invented this concept of you've got to have a superior product coming out of the yeah. box. Um, and uh, and they're the exception to the rule. Like I, I would, having done work with and for GM, I would push back really hard if any exec at GM said, said, you know, they care. And I said, I could name you 50 phone calls. And if you listen to that phone call, you'd say GM doesn't give a wit, you know, yeah. <laughs> about the end users. They care about the dealers, but they don't care about the end users. I don't care what they say. <laughs> yep. It's very complicated with companies like GM too, because I mean, what are they? They're, they're, they, they assemble stuff from their, 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 their their um, supply chain um, logistics people is all they really are. I mean, oh, I know. I, well, you remember back in the day when Michael Dell would hold an all hands on deck meeting and they would play yeah. a call where somebody had a problem and then he would ask the crowd, "Who's going to take care of this?" Well, mm -hmm. that's when they that's when they were you know a, a billion dollar company and setting records. I don't know if they still do stuff like that there. They might. But well, he did a lot of things back then. Yeah. I, I was on the receiving end of, of some of his anger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, and, he, but that's but how they, he, that's, he, that's he, how you build a company. He listened to customers, yeah, he listened to customers because he knew that he needed to. I mean, back when he first started, he was the guy interfacing with the customers, so he knew that's that right. without the customer, he had nothing. Well, I think, I, I think the guy's name is John Lagarde, the guy who took over T-Mobile. Mm -hmm. And uh, a few years ago, when T-Mobile had had a failed merger effort with AT and T, and the a lot of industry pundits were saying T-Mobile is going to go away. Well, he he actually put a phone on his desk where he could listen in on any customer service call, just just pick up the phone and listen. And sure. he used he used that to to you know help drive improvements to where T-Mobile went from bottom of the pack to top of the pack. So when companies at the very top say we're going to do it, it can get done, and it's it's irrespective of tools. I'm 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 very suspect when somebody tells me, well, if we just write this one big last check, then all our problems will go away. We'll put in whatever tool of the week it happens to be. Back in the day, it was it was let's just get Salesforce in, and Salesforce will yeah. fix all our problems, and then we'll be customer focused, or you know. Uh, or Oracle or, or something like that. So this one last check syndrome, I don't buy. It takes a mindset change. I tell you, if you have the mindset and a check for, let's say, Nuance and Microsoft Power BI, that essentially will find with AI those calls that you want to hear because it rates that call from a sentiment standpoint real time and Power BI yeah. can... Put this red fleet flashing Batman phone on the CEO's desk saying, we got a bad one here, boss. Yeah. So actually, there are some technology enablers that really are pretty cool lately. Yeah, if they're used. <laughs> if they're used, exactly. You got to use them. And, and that's a big paycheck as well. Um, but, yeah. But, yeah. but the kit that the leading companies are providing these days, it's just I watch it. I see it in practice. I'm like, oh my gosh, if I had this 20 years ago, my gosh, it oh, really yeah. makes your job easy if you use it. Yeah. Well, That's what's it. next for you, Alton? Tell me a little bit more about you. And we're going to put in the liner notes how to reach Alton if, if anybody well, wants to talk to absolutely. him. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people that are going to want to talk to you. Well, I'm still I'm still doing consulting. I like I like it. Um, I like working with uh, people who want to get something done. You know, I went through a period in 2021 where, where it was kind of a selfish criteria. I have to know you, I have to like you, and I have to like the project. <laughs> but uh, you know, I've I've worked on the on the buy side, and I've still and and then worked with companies that are either implementing a big 
outsourcing strategy or they run their own and they're not interested, but they want to get better. So uh, I still think there's there's lots of room for that kind of uh, uh, consulting opportunity um, and I enjoy it. So you don't have the itch that. to open another big contact center. It's interesting. I, I talked to a good friend of mine I've known for about 20 years this past week, and he wanted me to come in and run their sales and sales and marketing organization. And I'm, I'm really struggling. Like, is that really what I want to do? And I think I'd rather just kind of hunker down and, and be an independent and work with. I, I know I know enough other guys in my situation who, you know, like one's a real a real strong technology guy. He was my technology partner at uh, at True Source Labs when we opened that. I know, yeah. I know guy is probably one of the best analytics guys so I can put together a team you know on a project and and work with people that I know and trust and I don't have to look over their shoulders so that that that, that to me that's an ideal environment well I tell you what I think a lot of people are going to want to talk to you because um, you're you're the gold standard when it comes to to, to quality so so it's been a delight talking to you Alton and I look hey, forward same. to catching up with you in person again soon all right Rush you take care you too. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.